Histologic subtype, platinum free interval, number of lines of therapy, molecular signature, pre-existing toxicities, and the goals of therapy. Six things. Thank you. So to the point, the approval of bevacizumab in recurrent ovarian cancer is based on this antiquated nomenclature of platinum resistant and platinum sensitive recurrence. Tell us about the current approval of bevacizumab in recurrent disease. Absolutely. So you, you have, basically you can use it whenever you want. <laughs> right? So we can use it in the so-called platinum sensitive setting, which just means that they've had a, a long interval since their last platinum. Mm -hmm. And that's in combination with chemotherapy, whether that be paclitaxel and carboplatin or with gemcitabine and carboplatin. Okay. And so certainly you can add that bevacizumab to the chemotherapy in induction, try to get yourself a better response rate, and then proceed with bevacizumab as a maintenance strategy. Mm -hmm. um, or in using the antiquated terms, if you do have a patient that their tumor has progressed pretty shortly after the completion of primary therapy, um, then you can consider bevacizumab in addition to a single agent chemotherapy such as pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, paclitaxel, or topotecan. I like five FDA approved Got chemotherapy all backgrounds. All the options. Okay, and then I have our medical oncologist, our single medical oncologist on the panel. We're Ask all it. becoming medical oncologists. I was going to say. We operate less and less. I'm not We're sure all what becoming my medical oncologists. True so, title so is. That's very insightful. <laughs> I, I don't actually like to be called a surgeon that gives chemotherapy. I'm a medical oncologist that operates. Yeah. <laughs> be, because, exactly. because, because we operate no, less true. and less and we yeah. give more and more chemotherapy. Yeah. And we're becoming immunobiologists. Right. That's no, right. That's true. Exactly. So, Ursula, is bevacizumab a better frontline drug or a better second line drug with the assumption that we'll soon have FDA frontline approval? So that's, that's a great question. And I think, you know, what's going to inform that, at least for me, is the GUG218 overall survival uh, data. So if there is a really compelling reason to use Bev up front and, you can, and we can show and I can say to a patient, you know what, I mean, we're going to be able to improve your survival by using Bevacizumab, just much like we've used intraperitoneal therapy for, you know, using at the higher dose, 100, showing, yeah, it's going to be a survival benefit. Um, I think if that's not the case, and again, I don't know, um, Which then, will be presented to ASCO. Exactly. Hope, presented at ASCO, so we'll see. We'll see. That's submitted. correct. Submitted to ASCO, right? Um, then, um, then we use bevacizumab in certain clinical uh, situations within the recurrent setting. So I tend to use more bev uh, for platinum resistant disease, um, just because the two regimens that Shannon's already mentioned: carbotaxel, bev, carbogem, bev. So using reusing taxol again. Um, patients don't really love it uh, to reuse paclitaxel maybe so soon after they've just had their hair grow back or they've got some neuropathy. Mm -hmm. um, and with carbogem bev, um, there's certainly su su certain situations where I've used that, um, but there there's no OS benefit um, and the progression-free survival benefits, benefits around four months. Yeah. In the platinum resistance setting, um, I do think that the weekly paclitaxel BEV results special. Are, are special. They're outstanding. And maybe even NAB noteworthy. Paclitaxel. Maybe noteworthy. Noteworthy, yeah. So, so it, it, let me say it this way. So the hazard ratios are better in recurrent disease, mm -hmm. but the median yeah. differences yeah, are absolutely. better frontline. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're a median, the close to six months frontline is certainly better than four months in sensitive and three months in resistant disease. Mm -hmm. But the hazard ratio is much better in recurrent disease. Yeah, but I don't want to, you know, bevacizumab with topotecan, hazard ratio looks fantastic. Yeah, no, I get but it. I don't <laughs> think that necessarily we're going to jump on that regimen either. And, and, and maybe, maybe the risk of GI perforation is higher in recurrent disease. Although, as, as I think as you said, Dave, the risk of GI perforation becoming lower and lower because we understand the, the medication we're more advanced. We understand the patients who are higher risk. That's there you go. And... When you use it frontline, there's more number of cycles, and if there's more number of cycles, the cost increases frontline. So I think the magnitude of the benefit will be important as value, as you said, Matt, is added. Now, cost is more than just actual cost. The longer, we know there's cumulative toxicities yeah. of BEP, mm -hmm. hypertension and renal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So we really need, the cost is not just the actual dollar amount. The cost is to the patient and the ability to receive other chemotherapies in the future. Yeah. So that does have to come into play, particularly for somebody with some renal with renal toxicity. 